Now, I hope that this election will really end the uh, uh, arbitrary detention, imprisonment of many, many people, amongst them Osman. Welcome, very good that you're here, and let me give you a proper introduction. So Banu Güven Cheers. is a Turkish journalist, she's a TV presenter, and over 14 years she worked at the Turkish channel, TV channel, NTV, and she brought political news into the homes of millions of Turkish people. And due to the political situation and restriction on press freedom, she left Turkey for Germany. She writes reports and she comments on German media, such as VDA or uh, Deutsche Welle, and also the Turkish Arte TV, about human rights, domestic and foreign policy. And she's also been awarded many prizes, including the German Nannen Prize for extraordinary journalistic achievement. And she's here to talk about the elections and about Turkish future. So the elections are upcoming 14 May. How was the atmosphere in Turkey? Tense. <laughs> In one word, it's tense. People are also very hopeful at the same time. Uh, uh, on the one camp, there is more a feeling of concern, Erdogan's side, because they may lose the election, mm -hmm. not in the first round, maybe in the second one, most probably. Uh, and on the other side, uh, people are tired of Erdogan. This time, they really have uh, high hopes mm -hmm. uh, that something could change uh, after all, after a good 20 years or more. Before we dive like, totally into the elections, let's take um, a step back and look okay. at, the, at the bigger framework. And if you look at the AKP, what is, according to you, the legacy of 20 years of AKP rule? If you're looking at Turkish society, uh, right now. Okay. Actually, it's mm -hmm. Erdogan's legacy. AKP wouldn't exist if you take Erdogan mm -hmm. out of, of it. But um, Erdogan's legacy started actually much earlier when he was elected mayor uh, in, in Istanbul. I haven't told about the first time uh, so much often uh, of the first time when I met him. It was 93, before he got elected mayor. And I met him with a group of German students uh, in his party's headquarters in Istanbul. And he was so different. He was so ambitious, you know. He was so critical. He was so anti-system. He was so openly critical of Kemalism and so on. I told to my friends, you know, oh, I think he wants to become prime minister. And I was right. But that wasn't all. How could I know back then that he would change the, the meaning of presidency? He would change the whole system and uh, make himself president here. Back then, he was already working on uh, networking. I would say, uh, in, in this segment of the population which felt disadvantaged in Turkey, uh, politically, economically, because they go hand in hand, I believe, uh, they didn't feel themselves and they weren't belonging to the political elite or economic elite in the country. Erdogan, um, and his party, later his party too, uh, it's then beginning uh, of, of the 2000s. He first gave these people this feeling of I matter and I will have a say in government. I mean, this guy in power is going to represent me. When he was elected mayor, and it wasn't only him, uh, for his party, previous party. It was a huge success in Turkey. They got many, many districts. Uh, they won in many, many uh, cities. And they started to change the uh, uh, economic, um, um, uh, how should I say, uh, structures mm -hmm. uh, 
I mean, who would, this time the Anatolian, the uh, more um, middle-ranged uh, uh, companies would take the tenders, they would go and make some business, and people started to get uh, this feeling of power. And later on, uh, after the, uh, it was a very good timing actually, because there was this uh, economic crisis, uh, 2002, and right afterwards there were elections, and then he won the elections. Uh, I mean, he was politically banned back then, but it was his party, AKP, he had founded this party, and he said to everyone, we are a democratic party, we are conservative but democratic, and uh, we want to make things better. Uh, uh, than before. And also some um, uh, left liberals, leftist li uh, li liberal leftists belong, uh, believed in him uh, for a while. For the first decade, people became wealthier. So you saw these conservative uh, working class people getting uh, 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 middle class and also the business people, the, the small uh, en entrepreneurs or medium range entrepreneurs, a little bit um, in, in better positions, they were able to go to holidays, buy themselves cars, uh, because the, the, the uh, rates were low. So they still want to, they still remember how Erdogan changed life for them. So they don't want to lose these advantages, but they have already lost it. I believe that the most important element now for Erdogan voters is the narrative of a strong Turkey and a strong leader. You are afraid of him. And it's a bit like a Stockholm syndrome, maybe. I don't know. You're afraid of him, but you respect him. Is it respect or being afraid or... He knows the best, you, so you don't have to think about anything because he's telling you what to do, how many kids you should have. Really, I'm not joking. You should have four kids. You should get married, of course, and have four kids, at least. I mean, women are, of course, they should have the same rights, but they are not equal as men by nature, he, sh he says. Divorce is bad. Don't get divorced. I mean, even the, how many cigarettes you should smoke a day. Mm -hmm. So uh, they don't have to think mm -hmm. about anything. Mm -hmm. That's maybe uh, also very comfortable for them. He, he gave this uh, impression of being really the one who would stand up against all uh, injustice. So uh, that's what people believe somehow in Turkey because they don't hear the truth, actually. Some news they happen to see, and also social media, lots, there, there's lots of disinformation. And they don't see, for example, how he uh, was almost attacking a farmer once upon a time or slapping uh, someone after the biggest mine accident in Turkey because he was protesting him. And most importantly, the, in, in defense industries, uh, the, the, the unmanned uh, aerial vehicles, uh, drones, uh, built by his son-in-law, he has already developed an unmanned um, um, uh, jet fighter. Turkish jet fighter, and uh, there are billions of dollars worth uh, exports. But these are things which also, not only in Turkey, impresses uh, the voters, his voters, but also here in Netherlands, mm -hmm. and also in Germany, mm -hmm. because the diaspora needs some um, uh, national pride too, wants to enjoy this feeling mm -hmm. of coming from a strong country. Um, if you look at Turkish journalists who are now in Turkey, and if you look at the Turkish media landscape, almost 90% of the media are in hands of uh, Erdogan or even more businessmen who are affiliated to him. Yeah. So if you are Turkish journalist right now, can you report critically on the elections? 
Yes, you can report mm -hmm. critically on the elections, but then there are like tens of mm -hmm. or hundreds of problems you can face, like uh, first of all on the social media. And then the, there's this mechanism, uh, you can uh, go and um, file a complaint online on the website of the presidency. Then there are tens of complaints about you. And then if the prosecutor is um, somehow okay, uh, you, you're not being called uh, for uh, interrogation. Uh, otherwise, you have to go and visit every two months or so the prosecutor and then try to explain that not, not, what you did isn't wrong. So this is the general situation. And it's getting more and more complicated, more difficult to work in, in Turkey as a journalist. He is accusing Osman Kavala, actually. Mm -hmm. Osman Kavala... A philanthropist and is a, philanthropist. a businessman and a who's in jail right now. Yeah. Uh, he's a very good human being, really. And uh, he was arrested on f uh, mid, mid, mid of uh, October 2017. He is being accused of supporting or of financing a movement throughout the country where millions of people were part of, uh, like literally financing it. He had sent a plastic uh, a chair and some sandwiches to the park, Gezi Park, during the revolt, and that's financing. In a recent interview, he also tells how, what, what kind of a nonsense this is. And he's serving a life sentence right now, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And then there are other uh, friends, uh, very important uh, civil society figures. Um, they have been sentenced to 18 years, eight years. They are in prison and there are some who had to leave the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were acquitted actually, but then Erdogan was so furious about it and he was accusing this movement all the time. It's because of Gezi. It started by, uh, with Gezi. After 2013, our economy went uh, mm -hmm. uh, Collapse. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope that we are going to uh, see each other soon uh, before he will spend uh, six years full in prison. I mean, I hope that this election will really end the uh, arbitrary detention, imprisonment of many, many people, amongst them Osman. And why do you think this election is going to be a turning point? Because that's what you wrote a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, because you just uh, explained how people still back uh, the AKP and Erdogan. So why should these? Yeah. Why do you think it's going to be different now? We ca because we cannot stand it anymore. I mean, we cannot take it anymore. I mean, it's the democratic forces, the, the also young voters, many of them in the country. They want to enjoy freedom, finally. You already talked about people uh, put on certain positions uh, on the basis of loyalty and not yes. because of their capability, their experience, their, their knowledge. But if we're talking about the period after the election, if yeah. you're talking about how to, um, let's say the opposition wins, how to heal this country, but because it doesn't mean that the persons who are in certain p uh, positions in the judiciary, in the military, are immediately gone. There are a lot of people who are there. So exactly. can you explain a bit? It will be difficult to make things good again, but it's not impossible. What I mean is, um, you know, Erdogan is the guy at the moment who also has the legislative power. He minimized the power of the uh, parliament and he, through the system, uh, the Turkish presidential system, uh, he made it possible to govern a country uh, through presidential decrees in the force of law. They are in force of law. So, he, for example, made a list of people who were appoint, appointed by him and um, who, whose job would also finish along with, him, with the president. Uh, but then he made lots of um, exceptions too. Um, 
the chief of the intelligence, he is, he is going to leave his job if Erdogan loses, because he was appointed by Erdogan. But it's not the same for the uh, military, uh, for top positions. Uh, however, the military chief is going, uh, he will have to leave this year, uh, so he's going to be changed. He's, this is a very important position still. And there are some other top positions. Kılıçdaroğlu, if he would be president, uh, wouldn't be able to change without a, another decree. So what he's going to do is he will, at the very beginning, for some top bureaucratic positions, he is going to use the, uh, uh, the legislative power Erdogan created for himself, thinking that he would never lose the, uh, job, uh, the, the, the presidency, uh, his position. So that's why he started to say, you know what, actually we should do some uh, re uh, revision. Uh, um, uh, in the system. And he didn't give, uh, go into details, but I believe that's the revision he's talking about. Uh, because he never thought that he, he, can, he could lose uh, his position as president. So Kılıçdaroğlu is going to use this uh, power for some time. Uh, but it's not only about who will be elected as president, it's also about the majority in the parliament because the opposition uh, wants to change the system again, back to the parliamentary one, but a better parliamentary one system. For this, you really need at least 360 uh, voters, yeah. Seat, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, seats in the parliament. And this, the main opposition alliance could only uh, um, uh, reach this majority along with the leftist alliance. I believe together they may have, they may manage to uh, get uh, six, a little bit more than six, uh, um, 360 seats. So there could be a constitutional change, right? We should concentrate on the next coming two years, because if there will be a constitutional change for a better parliamentary system, in two years we are going to have elections again. And these two years are very important. Uh, Kılıçdaroğlu and his allies are going to get some foreign investment within these two years. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, the Turkish lira will, uh, um, I hope, uh, improve uh, as well. And the value um, is now, I mean, it's incredible. Um, and the economy, if the economy will be uh, um, uh, better in the couple of, uh, in, in the coming two years, then there's a good chance that this opposition can win elections again. If not, if they cannot control this I instrument called state, which was instrumentalized and politicized by Erdogan, if they cannot control it, if they cannot make it work properly uh, and find some solutions, then uh, in two years, who knows, maybe Erdogan, who would lose now, Makes a could comeback. win again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone who has a question? I have a lot of cards, but I want to, uh, yes. Okay, yes, that's what I thought. So uh, my colleague, uh, Carline, will come to you with uh, the mic. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm John London. I'm based at Leiden University from the US as well, where we no longer take presidential election results for granted. This is really an election of global significance. And what I'm curious about, even though we're looking beyond the election, is the integrity of the election. And I was heartened to listen to a podcast in which somebody remarked that voter turnout will expect it to be extremely high, 80 to 90 percent, which is absolutely unheard of in the rest of the world. Be lucky if you get half that in the United States. And yet I still have these concerns thinking about you know, Brasilia and Washington and DC, what can Erdogan possibly do to reverse a result? Somebody mm -hmm. mentioned the strength of Turkish civil society. 
even in the face of a bureaucracy that has been gut gutted and politicized. What can you say about the integrity of the upcoming elections? Mm -hmm. So in Turkey, the turnout is usually uh, high. Uh, it's been, f f for a very long time, uh, it's been uh, about 80%. It's uh, just um, how it is. Um, maybe because of the polarization we have in the country, uh, we have a, a bigger turnout compared to a, uh, other countries, but the integrity of elections, a very important question. Some friends in Germany ask me, oh, do you really believe that he will leave if he loses? Or even in Turkey, they say, they, they used to say, ha, huh, do you believe that there will be elections at all? And I was saying, yeah, I believe that. Then, do you believe that uh, the, the, the votes will be safe? Our votes will be secured? Uh, well, the opposition has learned some lessons in, in, the, couple of, in the last couple of elections. And uh, even though they, uh, politically, they are uh, not together, the, the leftist coalition, the, the right this party in the uh, main coalition, uh, opposition, uh, uh, they know how to collaborate when it comes to uh, ballots. And they make it impossible to rig the ballots, rig the election on the election day. But it's Erdogan who owns the system, meaning the judges the, the members of the higher electri board, electoral board uh, have been appointed by Erdogan. So they do whatever he says. Okay, there is this risk. But I believe this risk would exist, exist if he would lose the election with less than, a, less than a, one percentage of votes. Let's say if Kılıçdaroğlu would get something 50% uh, point some percent, and he would get like 49 or something, or, uh, I mean, if the difference would be too little, then he will do everything. Plus, he's controlling the channels of information, and he's trying his best to control more. His Minister of Interior tried to build a second electoral a supervision system, which uh, surprisingly the electoral uh, board, the, the, uh, the higher board, uh, refused. He wanted to have uh, another parallel system uh, in the police and gender, uh, gendarmerie, um, and it was refused. Uh, but I heard now that at TRT, the public uh, TV channel, uh, public broadcaster, they are uh, planning, they, 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 they are also trying to uh, work in tandem, I would say, with the electoral board. And there was a guy who, for example, uh, stopped the flow of uh, information, the, the data, uh, in the last elections because they didn't like the results and we didn't get any. <laughs> any results from the state news agency for hours. It was incredible. He is uh, uh, supposed to do his job again. That's what we heard today. So there will be some attempts. My question is regarding to the voting trends uh, of the diaspora constituents mm -hmm. and the constituents that are living in Turkey. So do you think that is there a deepening divide between the diaspora voters, uh, the the choices, the priorities of the diaspora voters and the voters that are living in Turkey. Let's talk about Europe and, uh, well, there are, in Europe, I believe there are around a little bit more than two million voters, uh, one and a half million being in Germany. And uh, half of these voters uh, went to ballots. Uh, in Germany, 48% this time, 
it was too I mean, higher than the previous elections, in the previous elections. Um, and the majority of these voters uh, are Erdogan and AKP supporters. We don't know about the rest, but they don't go voting because they have to go and vote in the Turkish uh, consulates. Some of them don't want to go to Turkish consulate and vote because they find it risky. They, they, many people who are political refugees, who used to be, uh, I mean, who, who have political motives who le and left Turkey and so on, uh, they don't even want to share their addresses, give their addresses. Uh, they don't want to get registered by the, by the consulates sometimes. Uh, and those who are registered don't want to go there. And also, you don't have uh, ballots in every city. So for, the, for half of the voters in Europe, I have to say, this thing of belonging and being proud of their roots is an important thing. And Erdogan gives them this feeling saying, look, you are still not 100% accepted uh, and welcomed in the countries where you live. And I am the one who will always support you, who will always be there for you, who will going to uh, fight your, for your rights, for your religion, and so on and so forth. And as long as we have a strong Turkey and strong leadership, you will be better off in the countries where you live. So they buy this argument, mostly. For example, in Netherlands, I believe, there were like 60% of votes uh, who went, uh, which went to AKP in the last elections. It's a lot, but it's not all the voters uh, who are Turkish citizens. We don't know what the rest, uh, mm -hmm. what, what the, the situation, how the situation would be if the rest uh, of the population would also, voters also go to the ballots. And plus, these people, most of them uh, came uh, uh, from uh, rural areas back then, it, it doesn't mean necessarily that they are conservatives uh, and religious people, etc. But most of them, obviously, are. So it's also it also has something to do with, with some ideology. Give her one round of applause again, Bani Güven. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.